This is what we astronomers call a blob, or a smudge to use more technical language. It may not look like much from here, but what do you expect for something near the literal edge of the observable universe? If you were there when this light was emitted, you'd A, be at the beginning of time, and B, be looking at an entire galaxy containing an enormous black hole at its heart. It's the most distant black hole we've semi-directly detected. That's cool enough on its own, but as an added bonus, this one smudge may have solved the mystery of the origin of the supermassive black holes in our modern universe. Introducing Abel 2744. It's a giant cluster of galaxies around 4 billion light years away basically our backyard, cosmologically speaking. The most interesting thing about Abel 2744, at least for us today, isn't what's in this cluster itself, but what's behind it. The cluster lives in a vast halo of dark matter that warps space across its 4 million light year span. Light from distant objects travelling through the cluster is deflected and magnified. The cluster is a stupendous gravitational lens that enables us to see much further than our puny human-made telescopes would normally allow. That's why the Hubble Space Telescope studied Abel 2744 in detail, and why it was one of the early must-dos for the James Webb Space Telescope. And this is where our smudge got interesting. JWST observes deep into infrared wavelengths and showed that this object has IR colours consistent with a galaxy whose normally visible light has been stretched out by the expanding universe, increasing or redshifting its wavelength by a factor of over 10. Higher redshift means lighter distance, and a redshift of 10.1 in this case means this light has been travelling to us for around 13.2 billion years, coming to us from a time near the beginning of time, when the universe was less than 3.5% its current age. That earned our smudge the name UHZ1 for Ultra High Redshift Galaxy Number 1, where the Z is the symbol for redshift. That's cool, but JWST has now found galaxies quite a bit more distant than this. The really exciting moment came when we pointed another orbiting satellite at this smudge. This is the image by the Chandra X-ray telescope. It turns out there are a lot of X-rays coming from this little blob. Now, X-rays are much harder to bring to sharp focus, so the four pixels of the X-ray light aren't coming from across this spread out region, but rather from something inside that region. There's really only one known way for a galaxy to be blasting out X-rays at this level, and that's by harboring a quasar. To refresh your memory, a quasar is when a supermassive black hole, an SMBH, that lives in the centre of every galaxy, starts feeding. As matter swirls towards the black hole, it's superheated until it outshines the entire surrounding galaxy. And just before it reaches the black hole, conditions get so crazy that the space outside the black hole glows bright with high-energy X-rays. Based on the amount of X-ray light and the distance, we can estimate that the black hole must be 40 million times our sun's mass. That's 10 times the mass of the Milky Way's own SMBH. UHZ-1 is the most distant quasar ever discovered, which makes it the earliest known quasar and so the earliest black hole that we have evidence for. So, with that out of the way, let's get to the good stuff. To understand why UHZ-1 is so exciting, you have to understand one of the biggest debates in cosmology, the origin of supermassive black holes. Essentially, every galaxy in the modern universe has at its core a black hole that's 100,000 to several billion times the mass of the Sun. We also see much smaller black holes, so-called stellar mass black holes, that can be in the rough range of 10 to 100 solar masses. Oddly, we don't see black holes in the middle range of 100 to 100,000, and we'll come back to why that's odd. Now, we know how to make stellar black holes. They're what you get when the core of a massive star collapses on itself after the star dies. So, how do you make a supermassive black hole? That's the big question. It could be that they grew from the very first stellar corpses in the early universe, 
gulping down gas and merging with other black holes for billions of years to reach their current enormous sizes. But over the last decade or so, as we looked to greater and greater distances, we started to find quasars shining out from the first billion years of cosmic time. Quasars powered by supermassive black holes that should not have had enough time to get that big. There are two potential solutions to this conundrum. Either black holes started small and grew way, way faster than we thought they could, or they started much bigger than the black holes that form in stellar deaths in the modern universe. These are the small seed and the heavy seed models, respectively. UHZ1 is going to help us choose between them. Let's start with the small seed model. Can a stellar corpse grow into a quasar engine in less than a billion years? Well, it's tricky. There's a limit to how fast a black hole can feed, even with an endless supply of gas. As gas spiraling into a black hole heats up, it blasts out radiation which pushes on the infalling gas and counters the black hole's gravity. Bigger black holes can eat more and radiate more, but there's always an approximate upper limit that increases with that mass. It's called the Eddington limit. You can calculate how big a black hole would grow feeding at this maximum rate for, say, a billion years. And the answer is not big enough to explain those early quasars. That said, there are various tricks we can include to make the small seed model work. There are scenarios in which black holes can feed somewhat faster than the Eddington limit, although they still need to feed non-stop to reach supermassive status so quickly, which itself is a problem. Or you could form a lot of black holes close to each other and have them merge very quickly, or you can start out with really, really big stars that leave behind black holes that are maybe a hundred or even a thousand times larger than those produced today. In the modern universe, all the heavy elements released in past supernovae cause gas clouds to fragment as they collapse, leading to smaller stars. But the pristine hydrogen and helium that filled the universe in the beginning held together as it collapsed, probably leading to gigantic stars and commensurately massive, but still not supermassive, black holes. With a combination of these tricks, fast and consistent feeding and biggish stellar black hole seeds, it's possible to make supermassive black holes in under a billion years. This still doesn't explain why we don't see any black holes in the 100 to 100,000 solar mass range. If SMBHs grew from stellar black holes by passing through this range, then you'd expect some stragglers to still be in that range, but that doesn't seem to be the case. Okay, so let's try the heavy seed model. What if the seeds of supermassive black holes weren't even born from the hyperdense cores of dead stars. And in fact, it's actually a misconception that you need extremely dense matter to make a black hole. For any given mass, there's a particular size that that mass needs to be crushed into in order to form a black hole. This is the Schwarzschild radius. For the sun, it's around three kilometers, and a solar mass crammed within that radius would have the same density as a typical 3,000 meter tall mountain crammed into a cubic centimeter. On the other hand, a typical chonky supermassive black hole of a billion solar masses has a Schwarzschild radius the size of Neptune's orbit. A billion suns crammed into that region would have the density of cotton candy. That's right, fill the solar system with cotton candy and you'd get an instant giant black hole. The early universe did not contain significant quantities of cotton candy at least as far as we can tell. But it was filled with a lot of gas that would later form stars and galaxies. As that gas started to collapse to make those things, the resulting protogalactic clouds may have had cores dense enough to collapse directly into black holes without ever forming a star. Again, this only works in the early universe where unpolluted hydrogen and helium doesn't tend to fragment as it collapses. And, as it happens, theoretical calculations of the expected sizes of these direct collapse black holes are right around the 100,000 solar mass mark. That gives us a way to go straight from gas to the smallest SMBHs without having to grow from stellar seeds through the intermediate range. And once you have a small SMBH, a pretty sensible rate of feeding can turn it into a large SMBH 
in mere hundreds of millions of years. Okay, great. Between our two models, small versus heavy seed, it's looking like the heavy seed model feels more plausible. So let's see what the new player, UHZ1, has to say about this. Previous record holders for the most distant quasar, like J1342 plus 0928, J0313 minus 1806, and J1007 plus 2115, are all similarly massive. And they had already put the small seed formation theory under a lot of stress over the past few years. But they were all found right around the 700 million years after the Big Bang mark just on the boundary of the amount of time needed to grow a small seed, assuming some very creative astrophysics to allow a really cosmic bulking phase. But UHZ1 shaves 200 million years off the allowed growth time. If it was marginally possible to grow a small seed into an SMBH before, it's now feeling nearly impossible. Let's look a bit more closely at this object to try to make this more concrete. Based on the JWST images, we can get an idea of the amount of starlight versus the quasar light in this object. Even those images are dominated by quasar light. The galaxy has around 40 million suns worth of mass in stars, the same as its mass in a black hole, and that's around a thousand times less than the stars in the Milky Way. This isn't unusual in itself. We expect galaxies from so long ago to still be building up mass and converting gas into stars. But for most of the universe's history, we see a pretty tight correlation between the number of stars in a galaxy and the mass of the central black hole. That has been taken by some to indicate that galaxies and their central black holes grow together in relative lockstep. UHZ1 suggests otherwise. It tells us that the black hole starts relatively enormous and then the stellar mass catches up. UHZ1 may represent the very first in a new class of object called an OBG for overly massive black hole galaxy or outsized black hole galaxy. OBGs are objects hypothesized to exist in the early universe in which the black hole and stellar masses are around the same. The amount of infrared and X-ray light coming from UHZ1 is consistent with simulations of OBG formation. So maybe this class of object is no longer hypothetical. If so, that tells us a lot. OBGs only work if their central black hole is formed by direct collapse, not through the growth of a stellar remnant. Overall, things are looking pretty good for the heavy seed model, but quite a bit less good for the small seed model. Now, it's not quite a smoking gun. For example, maybe UHZ1 is just weird. Perhaps it's SMBH formed in an unusual way for example from a rare and massive primordial black hole, or in an exotic environment like a quasi-star. But the fact that observations of UHZ1 line up so well with the direct collapse and the OBG model would tend to disfavour these alternate explanations, at least in UHZ1's case. And even if UHZ1 is an OBG, it doesn't mean other supermassive black holes couldn't have formed from small seeds. But in general, the case for the latter as an important source for SMBHs is being whittled away. So what's next? Well, we keep looking. UHZ1 is the first of its kind, but in astronomy, where there's one, there's often many, and hopefully soon we'll find the many. As JWST and Chandra continue their good work, we'll develop a clearer and clearer picture of what the earliest times were like as we discover more distant glimmers of the earliest stars and quasars that first lit up a newly born space-time. Hey guys, two things before we go. First, I want to tell you about Fascinating Fails over on PBS Terra. It's a show about scientific discoveries that were made by accident. Their latest episode is about the story of Penzias and Wilson and their discovery of cosmic background radiation. There's a link in the description. And if you go over, tell them politely that Spacetime sent you. Next, I want to let you know that because you asked, the classic black hole orbits design is now available on the Spacetime merch store as a t-shirt and for the first time as a sweatshirt. There's no better way to prepare for your next surprise encounter with a black hole 
than to carry a geodesic map of the exterior with you at all times, and now you can be warm at the same time. There's a link in the description to our merch store.